Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace. In the last five years, since the beginning of the 2017 season, we've seen 15 drivers make their debut in Formula One, usually younger drivers, but any driver in their debut season would be classed as a rookie. And there's been plenty of talk around rookies at the minute, particularly around obviously the current batch, Schumacher, Sonoda, and Mazepin, who, let's just say, haven't set the highest standards necessarily. But maybe, maybe that's just the level we should expect from rookies. Maybe we're being too harsh on them. Maybe we've been spoiled in recent years. So today I thought I'd look back across the last five years because that's a good number. We've got a lot of drivers who are currently in F1, a few that never continued and we all know who one of them is. I'm gonna look at all 15, their debut seasons in the sport and rank my personal opinion from best to worst. Quick caveat too, of course, with the 2021 lads, I'm only counting the first 13 races of the season because I'm filming this on the evening of the Zanville Grand Prix. And there are a few drivers in this list who didn't technically make their debut in their rookie season. They'd raced a few races in the year previous, but I'll let you know when we get to them. I'm just counting their first full year in the sport. Squarespace delivers a product that I genuinely believe in. I've been using it for years for my website and I guarantee anyone watching, doesn't matter who you are, could benefit from having your own website, whether you're a business owner, whether you just want to blog, whether you want a portfolio to show off your stuff, whether you've got lots of pictures of dogs like this one that you want to stick on. Now, but seriously, like I hate coding. I'm very intimidated when it comes to tech, which is ironic because I now work on the internet. But Squarespace makes it super easy, drag and drop 24 seven customer support to build your own website that just looks lush. You can get started completely free of charge. You can play around with the settings. Go to squarespace.com, have a go. The only time you're asked for any money is when you wanna put that website live to the world. And when that time comes around, don't forget to use the discount code TOMOF1 at checkout or give the link in the top line of the description a tap for 10% off your first website or domain. Let's start with Mr. Stoffel Van Dorn, a man you can't associate with Formula One and not also think about Fernando Alonso because over his two years in the sport, let's be real, Fernando destroyed him. The thing is though, his first season, Stoffel's first year in 2017 was definitely less of a demolition job than 2018. Stoffel did manage to beat Fernando in qualifying three times over the course of that year and only finished four points behind by the end of the season, 13 points to 17. So as much as Fernando was very much on top, it wasn't as bad as some other people in this. And, and also like Fernando Alonso, we know how good he is. He is quality to go against a driver in your debut season of that pedigree is always going to be a recipe for failure really, isn't it? He managed back-to-back -back P7s at Singapore, which is the race where Verstappen got sandwiched by the two Ferraris, which also took out Alonso, and he managed the P7 at Malaysia as well. He only managed two fewer point-scoring finishes all year than Fernando. So again, when you consider the calibre of his teammate and how rubbish that McLaren was in 2017, let's be real. I mean, still not great, but not terrible. Of course, now Stoffel is in Formula E. He was racing alongside Nick DeVries for Mercedes. He also was in LMP2 at Le Mans this year and finished second. Now, Lance Stroll. 2017, he made his debut season alongside a certain Mr. Felipe Massa. Now, of course, like Stoffel and Alonso, it's always going to be daunting to make your rookie season debut alongside a teammate with the pedigree of someone like Felipe Massa. But all things considered, he only finished three points behind Felipe by the end of the year. Yes, he only managed two qualifying victories over Felipe. So pace wise, he definitely wasn't there. But all things considered, points wise, pretty good, right? And obviously very much helped by that amazing P3 he managed at Baku in the Williams. Almost got P2, Valtteri pipped him at the line. He qualified P8 that race. So Q3, pretty good, put his car where he needed to and secured the dub, fair play in your rookie season. That was decent. He did only manage seven point scoring finishes all season though. Massa managed 13, but then it was Massa's 15th year in the sport. So that's, that should be expected, surely. And the final driver to make their debut in 2017 was Esteban Ocon. 
alongside Sergio Perez. Now he's mad to think that 2017 was his debut full rookie season. But actually Esteban did race in 2016. He raced nine races for Manor at the end of the year alongside Pascal Verlaine. Results weren't anything really to write home about because that was a proper backmarker team. But alongside Sergio Perez at Force India, things were very good. Head to head in qualifying, he beat out Sergio seven times in 20 races, which is very good. And by the end of the year, 87 points to Sergio's 100. I mean, the calibre that I hold Sergio in, Esteban like did a very good job. In fact, what's mad, Ocon only finished out of the points twice all season. Monaco, where he qualified P16, so he never really had a chance. And then in Brazil, we got caught up with Roman Grosjean in the Haas. 18 point scoring finishes in 20 races in your rookie season in a good car, but not a top, top car, quality. It is a miracle, though, that Sergio finished P7 in the Drivers' Championship, Esteban P8, because in 2017, as much as Esteban was driving the nuts off that car, they, used, they came together a lot. That was the big beef season between Esteban and Sergio. Like That's the only downside on what was otherwise an unreal rookie season from Esteban Ocon. How did they manage to finish so many races in the points when they kept crashing into each other? That is just mad to me. On to 2018, and we're gonna cover two drivers here because two drivers made their debut, Brendan Hartley and Pierre Gasly. Again, Pierre technically made his debut at the 2017 Malaysian Grand Prix, replacing Daniel Kvyat towards the end of the year. He then went on to permanently replace him into 2018. And then with Carlos Sainz leaving to McLaren, Brendan Hartley was drafted in to sit alongside Pierre. Now this one was pretty clear cut in 21 races. Brendan Hartley managed six qualifying dubs, 15 for Pierre. So Pierre was very much pace wise on top of Brendan. Now Brendan was unlucky in the races. There's a great video from uh, Josh Revel. I'll link it up above uh, talking about, you know, Brendan Hartley's bad luck, but ultimately, you know, four points to 29 in the end in favor of Gasly. He was firmly on top. I mean, Pierre's second race of the year, P4 at Bahrain. Bloody phenomenal, mate. Quality. Hartley managed three point scoring finishes all year. Pierre managed five and they were better quality as well. So yeah, I mean, it was no surprise really that Hartley got dropped and that Pierre got the call up to Red Bull for 2019. We know that didn't really go to plan, but his 2018 performances were quality. They were top notch. Hartley in 2019 moved to a Ferrari development role, actually, which was a bit of a weird one, but now he's gone back to sports cars. Hartley is quality when it comes to WEC and Le Mans and that. He's, he, that's his forte for sure. Also in 2018, we had a certain Mr. Charles, Charles, Charlie, Chuckles, Leclerc. Made his debut season at Alfa Romeo Sauber alongside Marcus Ericsson. Now, this was something pretty special. This is where we knew how good Charles truly was. Marcus was entering his fifth season in Formula One, having raced for Caterham in his debut year and Sauber there running. He was well embedded into that team. Fourth season with that team. Charles coming in, you'd think, eh, it'd take a while for him to get going. You know, maybe he could match Marcus. Nah, he did more than that. He slapped him about, mate. 17-4 in qualifying in favour of Charles. 39 points for Charles, just nine for Marcus. It was, you expect that to be the other way round. The rookie shouldn't be coming in and doing that. That's not normal. Marcus is a very, very talented driver. We see how well he's done in IndyCar and how well he did pretty good. Like, there's a reason he kept that seat for so long at Sauber. But Charles just came in and was like, jog on, mate. It's must want. Charles managed a P6 at Azerbaijan, just the fourth race of the season, the fourth race he'd ever had in a Formula One car, P6 in a Sauber. I mean, even the first race, Australia, the first Grand Prix of the year, he qualified less than a tenth behind Marcus Ericsson, who'd had five years in Formula One. I can't emphasize enough how mad that is to me. And by the end of the year, Charles managed three consecutive P7 finishes. And this was when you clear had Ferrari, Red Bull, Mercedes at the top. Best of the rest, three times in a row in an Alfa Romeo Sauber with his teammate nowhere. Just quality. And then the final driver to make their debut in 2018. A bit of a forgotten man, but 
I, th I think it's such a shame we didn't see more of him going forward. I'm talking about Sergei Sorokin, who made his debut with Williams alongside Sir Lancelot. Now, like I said, Stroll's debut season in 2017 was all right. You know, he, he, he did an all right job against Massa, all things considered, but Massa retired at the end of that year. That was time for Lance to kick on, you know. Rookie teammate coming in, he's got to beat him convincingly, put his foot down, make himself at home at that team. But then, you know, Sergei Sorokin came in and beat him 13-8 in qualifying. 13-8 in qualifying. Credit to Sergei. Credit to Sergei. He did a great job in qualifying. In the races, he only managed one point all year. Lance managed six. So from the points point of view, but in terms of actual performance, I'd argue Sergei had the stronger season. It was tight, but again, Sergei's the rookie. Lance is the one with a year of experience under his helmet. And yeah, I, I think Sergei did a good job. Sorokin did take a reserve role at McLaren and Renault for 2019 and then raced Le Mans and uh, went kind of Brendan Hartley way in terms of a lot of sports cars. Into 2019, a year that's known for its rookies. And we'll start with Mr. P7 in qualifying, who unfortunately couldn't convert in the race, Antonio Giovinazzi. Alongside Kimi Raikkonen, 2019, Alfa Romeo, Salba, and you know what? Nine dubs out of 20 races in qualifying for Antonio against Kimi Raikkonen, who finished third in the Drivers' Championship the year prior in a Ferrari in his rookie season, is very good. Pace-wise, qualifying pace, decent. The thing is, though, in the races, it didn't go so well. Antonio only managed four point scoring finishes all year. Kimi scored points in all four of the first races of the year, nine overall in total. So race-wise, and I think that rings true now as well, that Antonio is very much on top of Kimi right now in qualifying, but in the races, you still back Kimi to come through and beat him usually. A P5 at Brazil was of course Antonio's big highlight, benefiting big time from the Charles Seb incident and obviously Albon being spun out by Lewis. But even then, Kimi still finished P4. That is the that is the most forgotten P4 of all time. Kimi Raikkonen, 2019 Brazil. Most forgotten P4 of all time, 100%. <laughs> Next, we have a driver you might have heard of by the name of Lando Norris. 2019, alongside Carlos Sainz at McLaren, brand new driver pairing for 2019 with Stoff and Fernando out the door. A lot of unknowns for McLaren, but what a season and what a rookie season for Lando, because even though the points don't look great, 49 points to 96, performance-wise, Lando was on it. First of all, let's talk about qualifying. Carlos coming into his fifth year in the sport. Lando jumps into that seat and beats him 11-10 in qualifying. Big dub. Now in the races, again, big points gap, but Lando was a mad unlucky in 2019. Mad unlucky when you actually break down all of the incidents where stuff out of his hand took him out of the race, you know? Belgium, his engine broke down. It, it's broken moment. Canada, his brakes melted at the rear, so his rear right tyre just... Well, the whole suspension came off. China, he got yeeted when Kvyat and Science and him kind of, but it wasn't really Lando's fault that. Germany had a car failure. He couldn't capitalize on that insane race where there were just points begging for the lower teams. Silverstone, he had a poor strategy, which he was running top 10 comfortably and it put him out of it. And Mexico, I mean, terrible pit stop. He pulled in and had to pull back in because they'd ballsed it up. So he was very, very, very unlucky. His performances were pretty damn close to Carlos Sainz. And Carlos had a great year. But as well, I can't just give plaudits because he was unlucky. You never know how those races could have gone. It looks like they could have been promising. I mean, Belgium's a prime example. He would have been, he's got a butt ton of points if he'd have actually finished that race. But a lot of the others, you're just like, uh, maybe he'd have had a good race. It's difficult to say. Next, we have the Lord, the Messiah, the Saviour. It's obviously Alex. Uh, 2019, I'm happy to talk about his 2019 season because his 2019 season was very good. 2020, we don't need to talk about that in this video. That could, we could just forget that happened. He had two teammates, of course, because he started the season at Toro Rosso. His debut rookie season started alongside Daniel Kvyat and then 12 races in, he replaced Pierre Gasly at Red Bull in his debut rookie season. Important to remember, I think. I think that gets forgotten how well he did when he jumped into that Red Bull in his rookie season. But we'll get to that. 
Kvyat, just like Science, was entering his fifth year in the sport. He'd been on the sidelines in 2018. He'd been dropped for Pierre Gasly. He was back in the team. Daniel Kvyat definitely had a point to prove. And again, he's going into his fifth season. You've got a rookie coming in alongside him. Daniel Kvyat needed to wipe the floor with Alex Albon. And that didn't happen, objectively. Like, Alex outqualified him 6-5. Yes, Kvyat outscored him points-wise. 27 points to 16. Obviously helped in a big way by his P3 in Germany. Alex also managed a P5 in that race. But all in all, it wasn't the demolition job I think Daniel Kvyat needed to do in order to get a second chance at that Red Bull seat. Alex showed enough promise, including that, which again, he binned it in practice, missed out qualifying in China, had to come from the back, managed to get into the points, P20 to P10, in a Toro Rosso. Very, very good. He showed enough promise for Red Bull to give him a chance towards the end of that 2019 season where Pierre just wasn't delivering. The fact that Alex jumped into that Red Bull seat in his rookie year and put it in the top six, every single one of those nine races, except from Brazil, which we know would have been a P2 if it wasn't for Lewis. And of course he was trounced by Max in qualifying, 8-1. I mean, he did match Max to the thousandth of a second at Suzuka, but Max set his time first, so the history books will never remember that one dub that he did almost get. And again, in the Red Bull, Alex managed 76 points in those nine races. Max managed 94. Now, when you compare that to Gasly versus Max, Gasly managed 63, Max 181. So points-wise, consistency-wise, over the course of that time, you can't deny he did a very, very good job, relative to Gasly, at least. You could say that Alex was a victim of his own relative success. He came into the Red Bull, did a better job than Pierre, but obviously 2020, I don't want to talk about it, so I'm not going to. On to the next one. Because the last man to make his debut in F1 in 2019 was, of course, George Russell. Alongside Robert Kubica in that terrible Williams. That Williams was so ugly and so slow. 21-0 in qualifying is, of course, very impressive. But it is difficult to judge because, of course, we know the Robert Kubica who was coming back to the sport wasn't the Robert Kubica who left the sport after his horrific rally accident in 2011. It's a miracle he can still race in F1. And, you know, he raced this weekend at Zandvoort as well. Big up Robert Kubica. Prime Kubica was one of the most well-considered drivers by other drivers of recent memory. Like, he could have definitely won world titles if you gave him the equipment but it was a shame obviously it's great to see him back though in 2019 fantastic story but he was well and truly beaten by George but how much of that is Kubica losing performance how much of that is George being great I mean from what we're seeing now of George I think he is clearly a great and insane racing driver who's probably going to get that Mercedes seat it's not announced at the time of filming but come on it's happening and in terms of those elusive points, that was a niche George wouldn't go on to scratch until Hungary this year, right? He didn't score any in 2019, any in 2020. You know, Kubica seized that opportunity. 2019 German Grand Prix, weather was mad. George was in prime position, made a mistake. Kubica took his P10 and took the point. Fair play. But over the course of the year, Kubica only finished ahead of George on track when they both finished the race twice all year. So it was definitely, you know, a considerable win overall for George but like I said at the start it is it's difficult to measure how good Robert Kubica was he clearly wasn't the driver he used to be how much had he lost it's it's hard to say on to 2020 and just one driver would make their debut appearance in 2020 and it is of course everyone's favorite Nutella man Nicholas Latifi George convincingly 20 nil in qualifying unbeaten to this day in a Williams in qualifying Latifi again P2 in F2 very competent driver won races in Formula 2 clearly a very talented young man but was firmly beaten out by George although if it wasn't for George taking those few points from the Sakir Grand Prix in the Mercedes Latifi would have actually finished ahead of George because I think Latifi scored three P11s versus George's one in 2020. So that would have meant Latifi had technically finished ahead of George, but George got the Mercedes seat for that one race. Yes, the fact that he scored two more P11s than George might make you think, oh, Latifi had a better season. But actually, when both cars finished, Latifi only finished ahead of George twice all year. So 
I know that, you know, Mr. Saturday, George Russell, blah, blah, blah. But even in the races, George typically still very much had the measure of Nicholas. Nicholas was better in the races, but still not on George's level. No way. Look at the results. It's just not the case. Nicholas has done a much better job this year. I think there's definitely been signs of improvement. Obviously, George has improved as well. Um, but 2020 definitely didn't help. Like all the pay driver criticism that came his way. The fact that he got... 20 nil in qualifying didn't help alleviate those pressures really did it and then on to 2021 three drivers making their debut this season and we'll start with yuki Tsunoda, who's at alpha tauri alongside pierre gasly and it's not going great for yuki it's 13 nil in qualifying he's got 18 points versus pierre's 66 pierre just scored another p4 phenomenal from pierre this year I think Yuki's, it, it's one of them. He's a rookie coming in alongside a driver who's on their job right now. Pierre's on a madness. And it's like, how can, it's a lot to expect Yuki to be close, but he's so far off. 10 times this year, Pierre has qualified in the top six. Yuki's gone out of Q1 seven times this year. There's just, in terms of demolition jobs, this is up there, mate. It's not good. And especially after the first race of the season, Yuki finished P9. He was my driver of the weekend in his first ever Grand Prix at Bahrain. P9. Great performance. I was like, I was gassed. He was my favorite F2 driver last year. I was buzzing. I was like, yeah, he's going to go on to bigger, better things. This is Yuki Snowder. He's going to be quality. A lot of hype coming from Honda. A lot of hype coming from Red Bull. And then Pierre was just like, get in your place. No, it's not happening. Look, the kid's taken consecutive jumps from Formula 4 to Formula 3 to Formula 2 to Formula 1 each season, one after the other. But I just think he needs another year. He's very raw, Yuki. I think there is a diamond in there. It is in there. They just need to... He needs a lot of management, I feel like, Yuki. He's very, 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 you know, emotional on the radio, which can't help his performances. It just can't. The only times Yuki has finished ahead of Pierre when both cars have finished is when Pierre lost his front wing at Bahrain in the first race of the year and when Pierre got a puncher at Silverstone. So in the races, it has also been convincing. Pierre's P7 at Azerbaijan was very, very good. But even then, Pierre put it P3 on the podium. P6 at Hungary, also great. But then you consider how Pierre got caught up in that first corner incident fell back to p12 managed to recover not only pass yuki but gap him enough to have a free pit stop onto softs and then set the fastest lap the thing is that alpha tauri torosso historically the drivers are typically pretty close it's not one of them teams where like red bull where you're seeing consistently one driver massively outperforming you might think okay they're prioritizing one driver over the other I don't see that happening at AlphaTauri. Like, it's in AlphaTauri, it's in Honda, it's in Red Bull's best interest to give Yuki as good a car as Pierre is getting. So I've got no doubt he's getting every opportunity that Pierre is, and he's nowhere near. I don't think you can use that excuse with this driver pairing. I just think he's being destroyed, and I think Yuki's really struggling. I feel for the lad, I do, because it, it, it can't be nice seeing your teammate so consistently right up there and you're not even in the same postcode. And finally, in 2021, Mick Schumacher and Nikita Mazepin have made their debut rookie seasons, both at Haas. Big risk from Haas going with two rookies. And I mean, it's definitely not paid off, is it? But I'll tell you what, going into this year, because look, I don't like Nikita, okay? I don't agree with how he's conducted himself in the past and I don't think he's a particularly nice bloke. But I'm gonna put that to one side. In terms of Formula 2, he won races in Formula 2. He won at Silverstone. He won at Mugello as well. I thought you know, Schumacher's probably going to outperform Mazepin, but, you know, it'd be, it'd be fairly close because they're both rookies. They're both never driven F1 cars before, but it's not even been close. Qualifying, 11-2. The only times Nikita is qualified ahead of Mick is because Mick committed the cardinal sin of binning it in FP3 and not even making qualifying. So when it's actually been qualifying on pace, it has been a whitewash. It has been close a couple of times, but most of the time, there's a good half a second gap. And on race pace as well, I mean, there's only two occasions in 13 races when both drivers have finished, that Nikita's finished ahead of Mick at Monaco and at Silverstone. To be fair, at Silverstone, the race I went to, actually, Nikita was catching him, overtook him. 
He looked like the quicker driver that day. I'm assuming Mick must have had a problem considering how far ahead he's been in Nikita before that weekend. But fair play that weekend, Mazepin was definitely the better driver. But again, this is difficult to judge because they're both unknown prospects coming into this year. Is Schumacher top tier and Nikita's good and just being exploited by how good Schumacher is? Or is Schumacher okay and is Nikita trash? Mick, it's hard to say. He's obviously been a lot better than Nikita. He's still making mistakes, but you've got to make some mistakes in your rookie year. I get that. And the pace has to be the, the main thing. And he's been much quicker. I'd love to see Mick alongside a known quantity teammate to actually make a proper judgment, you know. So that's 15 all done. Let's quickly rattle through from P15 to first how I rank all of these 15 rookie seasons. And then we'll be done. In 15th, 2021 Nikita Mazepin, I'm sorry, you're destroyed by your rookie teammate. It's not good enough. In P14, I'm putting 2020 Nicholas Latifi. Sorry, Nicholas, you've seemed like a very, very nice bloke, but that season was was a big L. P13 is 2021 Yuki Tsunoda. Promising signs occasionally, but all in all, he's just being sent to the cleaners. P12, I'm putting 2018 Brendan Hartley. Unlucky at times, granted, but again, given this was Pierre's first full season as well and how convincingly he outscored, outpaced, outqualified him, it's got, uh, sorry, Brendan, it's got to be. P11, 2017 Stoffel Van Dorn. Yes, he was demolished. He managed three quality dubs over Fernando, but Fernando's so good, it was always going to be uphill battle. In P10, I'm putting 2018 Sergei Sorokin. I think he outperformed Lance Stroll, but also 2018 Lance Stroll, wasn't very good. So in P9, I'm putting 2021 Mick Schumacher. Yes, he's demolishing his teammate, but it's Nikita Mazepin. Very hard to judge. I can't really put him higher than this. P8, I'm putting 2017 Lance Stroll. I thought actually 2017, I mean, obviously it helps getting that P3 at Baku. Otherwise it wasn't amazing, but it wasn't terrible either. It's Felipe Massari's teammate. So it was okay. P7, I'm putting 2017 Antonio Giovinazzi. The amount of qualifying dubs he got against Kimi Raikkonen has to be a good sign of rookie pace. It's just a shame he come unstuck in the races. P6, I'm putting 2018 Pierre Gasly. Yes, he did a much better job than Brendan Hartley and earned that Red Bull call up. But again, Brendan was also a rookie, so it's hard to judge. I'm going to say that a lot. P5, 2019 George Russell. Hard to judge once again because he's against Kubica. We don't know where Kubica's level was at when he came back, but he did everything that he could be asked of, surely, apart from scoring that one point, I guess. P4, these were tight. I have gone with Lando Norris. As impressive as it was, there's too many unlucky moments that I can't just say, oh, he definitely would have scored this many points. He definitely would have done that. But it was a very, very good season. These top four all had very, very good rookie seasons. But Lando's come in P4. P3, 2019 Alex Albon. Call me bias. All you like. He won FIA Rookie of the Year for a reason. Pretty much matched Daniel Kvyat performance-wise. Did a better job than Pierre in that Red Bull. Let's not talk about 2020. 2019, very good, Alex. Well done, mate. And that leaves two. And in P2, 2017 Esteban Ocon, alongside Sergio Perez, pretty much matched. He's way more experienced teammate. We know how good Sergio is. I think Esteban's proven now how good he is as well. It was a great debut year. He did a fantastic job against, again, such an established teammate. It's a shame it came to blows a few times, but great job, Esteban. And that leaves in first place, P1, 2018, Charles Leclerc. It just was so good rookie season you don't see rookie seasons like that especially with a lack of testing they have these days maybe back in the day when they could test to their heart's content but these days nah you don't see that level of testing phenomenal from Charles. easy p1 so we're done thank you everyone so much for watching if you got to this stage you're clearly a real one so thank you leave a like if you enjoyed this one and comment down below maybe let me know have i missed anything have i called this wrong maybe what's your like top five rookie seasons of the last five years maybe not 15 because that's quite long for you but yeah appreciate you taking the time my name continues to be tomo thank you also to squarespace for sponsoring this video thanks again have a good one. Ta -da.